to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. A land of spectacular palaces and hill forts, Mewar, on the southern tip of Rajasthan, is also a land of heroes and legends, most of which are around the Ranas or rulers of the erstwhile kingdom of Mewar, who took on powerful foes for centuries. Travelling through Kumbhalgarh, the fort with the longest wall in the world, you can't help but think of the brute force that it signifies and the refuge it provided to its kings especially the famous Maharana Pratap, who took on Mughal Emperor Akbar's armies. It is here that Pratap was also born. We travel back in time to trace his story and the story of Mewar itself with renowned historian Reema Huja, whose book Maharana Pratap, an Invincible Warrior, delves into his life and times. This is a statue of Maharana Pratap on his horse Chetak who died taking him to safety after the famous Battle of Haldi Ghati in 1576. This memorial, built close to the battleground, is today a major draw and pilgrimage site, a mark of respect to this figure from history who became a hero in his lifetime and remains a legend centuries later. So how did this transformation happen? There are a couple of layers to what goes on with Maharana Pratap. One is that while he is in his lifetime and in Akbar's lifetime, the confrontation is being very closely watched by a lot of people. And when I say confrontation, it's not just the battle, it's a battle of wits. It's not just Haldigati or Dever, which is another battle which kind of turns the tide in favor of Mewar. Uh, but this whole thing of not yielding is being watched by others. He is not the only ruler who is not yielding, uh, Marwar Rao Chandrasen, he was Maharana Uday Singh's father-in-law. So that tradition of uh, other people also is part of what Prince Pratap has grown up with. But then a lot of that story gets retold afterwards by a lot of people but especially by people in Mewar in the lifetime of a great grandson who is uh, confronting Aurangzeb. So there are strong parallels there which uh, the people of Mewar would like to or Kaviraj Shamaldas to put a name on the person who puts some, something down in Veer Vinod. He wants to again hold up to a later society what confrontation can be about, what you can lose but you never lose heart, you never lose your spirit of giving way. And that is what becomes part of the hagiography that has grown. Prior to uh, Shamaldas, of course, Todd was there. And Todd had come across the story of Sangha, the grandfather of Rana Pratap, of Rana Uday Singh, who in Todd's eyes gave up Chittor and moved away. And then Pratap, who as the stories grew and what Todd heard was he was willing to let his children literally starve and eat not quite ghas ki roti but uh, the coarse grains. So someone who is willing to do all of that for the sake of the people of the land, not for himself and his crown. Before we get into the life of Maharana Pratap, because he's a hero, but he's also a tragic hero. He's a man who was hounded, but he stood his ground and he's quite fascinating as a person. But I am going to take a step back because uh, I have two areas of great interest. The first is really uh, the region of Mewar itself. It's, a, it's, a, it's an island oasis literally in the middle of uh, Rajasthan. It's surrounded by these beautiful Aravali hills uh, and that's why you've got these great forts of Kumbalgarh etc on the, on the Aravali top. Uh, strategically, uh, Mewar has always been uh, an area of great interest for anybody ruling uh, over the Gangetic Plain, be it Alauddin Khilji who came there in 1303, or, uh, or the Mughals who chased up all the way till the time of Aurangzeb, right? Why was Mewar so important? Why was that region so important? Lots of things. Geographically, the hills become a natural uh, shelter, not just refuge, not something you come to only because it's, you have to hide. But it gives you valleys, it gives you heights. So you have enough to grow for your local needs. 
but it also has mineral resources and we sometimes uh, undervalue what is available so there is copper there uh, a long time ago I was I, I claim to be a lapsed archaeologist now because I don't practice archaeology but there was a point where I did a PhD in archaeology and I worked on a culture that is Mewar based the Har culture roughly contemporary with Harappa Mohenjo-daro where they're using local chalcopyrite to make copper eventually I think the transition to iron also happens locally uh, with the byproduct but so copper is there tiny amount of silver is there uh, lead is there and then something that is again undervalued and that is they have zinc and we in India were making zinc at Zawar which is part of the Mewar area from about the 10th 12th century certainly so natural resources mineral resources then trade routes you want to go somewhere you know you go from A to B you pass through a lot of areas the best routes down to Malwa and to Gujarat they were alternate routes one of the better routes also went through Mewar routes going across uh, from again maybe Kabul down to the Deccan area Burhanpur beyond one of the good routes was through Mewar so you need Mewar and it's fascinating you know you think of a, a, a dynasty you think of a people and the dynasty and those people think of the land as theirs but if you go far back enough into time there's been so much movement that who does the land actually belong to maybe to the people who were living there and farming this silver in the second century BCE maybe to the 15th century maybe to us today so I mean that's more of a stupid philosophical answer I don't know what I mean but certainly that would have been one of the things that would have uh, resulted in Mewar being central for a lot of demands they need the root they need the minerals uh, food yes but there are there are other kind of food bowls but that is important enough so Reema, that is that brings me to the next question that I have. You know, I'm not going to go back to the Ahar culture. We should have a separate conversation on that. But you know, what you do do is trace back through legend and stories the genesis of the uh, family of Mewar, which is the Guhila. Um, it is a very strong connection with the Beels, which are the tribals of that region. They are constantly in the reckoning because both Rana Pratap's, uh, Bharana Pratap's uh, father and he have a very close connection with Kumbhalgar and the Bheels around. But uh, what did you get about the early history? Because you've traced it back to the 6th, 7th century CE, which, uh, which is quite fascinating because we know of the later history of the Rajputs and, and the region. We know very little about that transition. You know, uh, who were the Guhilas and uh, where did this uh, dynasty start? Right. So again, in common with a lot of places, the early ancestors, not much is written about them. And it is more what is transmitted down time, you know, what people remember, which then eventually gets put in their genealogies. And the popular, the most popular of the legends says that there was a young prince called uh, Guha because he had been born in a, far, in a cave. Uh, and the, the, again, the legend is that wherever his own native uh, land was possibly it was in the Gujarat area they later claims are it was a Hilwada and it is overrun by attackers and so the pregnant mother flees with you know to to safety or a young mother with a child flees this is the kind of common motive and the child is born in a cave and therefore is cave born Guha Guhela uh, grows up amongst the local peoples the mother then becomes like the sister of the, in this case, the local Bheel, but there are other e equal things where whoever the forest dwellers are make this uh, noble born lost widowed princess or just lost princess a sister. So the child grows up there and then from there becomes the ruler of the area. And somewhere implicit in that story is that because he is born, he doesn't know himself but of course the mother knows and keeps it secret so that uh, nobody attacks this young child while he's still fragile or something but the child then reveals these kind of warrior leadership like qualities 
and brings together the local people. So in this case, Guha, they are playing a game and Guha becomes the ruler and the, the king in that little game of children and starts dispensing justice. A bit like the stories we have of maybe King Bhoj as a child doing it or somebody else doing it, Shalivahan as a child doing it. And uh, the local people then acknowledge him. And that, that area is somewhere in Madhya Pradesh. But the empire or the kingdom that he conquers becomes Mewar, becomes part of Mewar. And Mewar as a term predates the Gohils. It's like Merpat, the land of the Mares. So now who are the Mares? How far back in time are we going? Are they people? Are they the Medians like some people suggest? Again, not going down that path. But history's got so many layers. So young Guha and then his immediate ancestors whose names are given and they become part of a genealogy but not too much is known. And then there are other ancestors closer to our time. This is the famous fort of Chittorgarh that is perhaps the most potent symbol of Mewar's history and a period of brutal battles that fostered the legends commonly associated with it. It was this fort that Alauddin Khilji attacked in 1303 and around 250 years later, when Pratap was still a boy, Akbar himself led the attack here, with terrible consequences. Akbar's conflict with Mewar was in stark contrast to the relations he had forged with other kingdoms of the region. Why is that? You know, one of the interesting aspects also is uh, uh, the, uh, the way uh, in which uh, the relationship between the Mewar Ranas and the Mughals kind of uh, evolves. You mentioned the Battle of Khanwa. This happened in 1527 after the first Battle of Panipat. Uh, it was against the Rajputs led by Maharana Sangha from, uh, from Mewar. But there is a side story to it, which you have referred to, that Babur felt that he had been um, you know, uh, betrayed by Rana Sangha because Rana Sangha was to come and help him against Ibrahim Lodi. Where does the story emanate from? Because that's an interesting backstory to this relationship between the Mewar royals and the Mughals. So now one doesn't find a reference to that story except in books on history written in the 19th and 20th century from the Rajasthan side. But contemporary Mughal records are constantly talking about it. Babar himself seems to refer to it. And one of the things which comes through in Akbar's uh, understanding of the situation is people constantly saying to him, you have to take over Mewar because the Mewar ruler had prom then Mewar ruler had promised your grandfather that he would assist him. And the Mewar people say we never did. So this again is one of those things of uh, different perspectives who do you listen to and then what becomes part of the dominant narrative. So the dominant narrative around Akbar's time seems to somewhere indicate that uh, there may have been some overtures from the Mewar side whether it was directly from Sangha or someone from his court or whether they were just testing the waters to see how it would help them against the Lodis. The people from Rajasthan say that Sangha was strong enough, he was occupying so many other kingdoms. Uh, and this, by the way, is a way of showing how strong a king is. How many people can you get under you? How many kingdoms can you defeat? It also creates enemies, but that's a kind of a footnote here. So from the Mewar point of view or from the Rajasthan, other non-Mewar uh, point of view, they say, you know, why would he need to send such a letter? But that notion of this overture to Babur saying, if you come to India, maybe we can combine forces, is a very strong point for the Mughals. It's being negated now. I'm not sure where the, the, the reality, where the reality is really situated. Right. And it's important to look at every aspect because these are the stories that make the, the, the final uh, piece. Uh, the next question is that how do you as a historian contend with the fact that at a time when Akbar was talking about Sulekul and the whole uh, special treatment to the Rajputana area, because he was very vicious in his campaigns in Malwa, in Kashmir, in Gujarat, and yet he had a different policy towards Rajasthan. First, how does Mewar fit into it? Why did Mewar remain out of this purview? Was this 
because of this emotional history uh, that uh, you know Mewar kept out of any kind of alliance. All right, I, I'll use that word of yours first. Emotional history is always there. Uh, whether it is to do with Mewar and the Mughals or Mewar and the Bundi people or May, you know anyone. And I think it is part of not just these two specific Mewar and Mughals, but that immediate remembered history. Some things happened to the father or the grandfather or some immediate relative which shapes the policy of the next ruler. That is one part of it. But the other part is also that Akbar was actually pretty brutal when it came to the siege of Chittor because up till the point that Chittor fell, he was attacking. He is respecting what Jamal of Badnor is doing as a commander and you know, is, apparently he is the, uh, Akbar is the one who shot a musket and killed Jamal and afterwards Fattah defends. So he is admiring what the warriors are doing. The Battle of Chittorgarh in 1568 marked a brutal assault by the Mughals and is regarded as a slur on an otherwise celebrated reign of Akbar that saw him peace, universal brotherhood. In 1568, after Chittorgarh was taken, all the survivors were killed at his orders. Now there are several things that happen and one part of it is the Johar and Shaka part. Uh, just to build back to what Akbar did, which was his last, it seems, act of extreme brutality in Rajasthan. And that is in 1568 when Chittor falls. Chittor doesn't yield, but what does happen, and which is again why I'm bringing in the part, so Johar would be when it looked like the battle could not be won, and you're inside a fort, your supplies have run short, there's no help coming, the decision would be taken, and then the vulnerable sections, the children, elderly, and the women, particularly the women of the royal family, who did not want to be taken captive, would perform self-immolation. So this great fire would be built, they would enter the fire, they, this, there would be nothing left of them basically but ashes. So the men would then put on their kesariya or their kasum, all these specific colors which would denote what they were doing next and kind of take an oath of fighting to the death. And like the berserker vikings almost, but they are, they are the berserker vikings of India, they would open the gates of the fort, rush out, not expecting to live, but take as many people to death with them, to the next world with them. Now, at the end of this Johar and Shaka of Chittor in 1568, when Akbar entered this desolate city where the fires were still burning, where people, you know, there, there is, you can use your imagination really, he ordered a massacre of the survivors. Again, the number of people varies. Some say there were a thousand survivors, some say no, because people had fled. But usually at this point, the non-combatants would be spared. And Akbar later repented, but you know, you, repenting will not bring people back to life. So he ordered the massacre and finally was told, you know, stop it. And he did stop it and had an, a statue of Jamal and Fatta built and it was a way of showing. So all of this becomes the emotional history that is carried on and becomes a reason for never yielding. Also becomes a reason for the bards, in the Rajasthan case, the, the Charans, Bharts, Badavas of different communities, egging the rulers on to act in a certain way. At the Mughal court or at the Afghan courts or at the other uh, courts, the non-Rajput courts, the, the, it could even be the other Hindu courts, uh, there are other record keepers who keep bringing the past up for rulers to work and act in a certain way. Right. So in 1572, uh, Maharana Pratap uh, is coronated. Uh, he's not, uh, I mean, it's again a difficult coronation because I, we won't get into that because his father had somebody else in mind. But having said which, uh, in 1576 is the great battle of Haldi Ghati. Right. Now, between 72 and 76, there are various emissaries that you mentioned who come to try and convince uh, Maharana Pratap to, uh, to uh, make peace with Akbar. It doesn't work out. Uh, 
what were the equations like? And you know, it's quite interesting. I don't think uh, Maharana Pratap ever lived in Chittor. He, I think for Ch Rana Pratap, it was always a regret that he could never win back the ancestral capital. It's one of those things that you take an oath for. So emissaries came, yes. I don't really know if they were specifically sent all the way from Agra to talk to Rana Pratap because we know that in the case of Prince uh, Man Singh of Amir, he was on his way back from the Gujarat campaign. He was told, you know, go and deal with Dungarpur and then also go and talk to Pratap because it is crucial that we have Mewar join uh, the, the Mughal uh, camp, so to speak, and it doesn't work. And uh, then later, uh, 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 Man Singh's father is sent, Raja Bhagwan Das, and that doesn't work. And Raja Todanwal is sent. So these three emissaries. And then the legend grows up, you know, that they, they, are, they are sent certain robes of honor. Pratap will not take it. A uh, lot of the, the insult being offered to Man Singh saying, go bring your uncle. And a Rajput here said that, you know, the Mewar and the Dundar families that were Kachwaha clan that Man Singh comes from were related by marriage and by relationship, a Mewar princess had married um, the grand great grandfather of Man Singh. So in relationship then Pratap and he are like uncle and nephew. So you will not be using uh, a form of insult which reflects back on your family. You know if you insult your own family one branch of it you're insulting the branch that that comes back to you also. But these are again part of the urban legend things which grow up and I think the the end of it is that in these four years Akbar had his hands full with a lot of things and would have wanted to have these trade relations open. He's already occupied half of the kingdom of Mewar. So Akbar is not necessarily in a hurry. Pratap is using this time to perhaps get some strength back into the Mewar armies because as we've already, you know, if you look at the history, they've been, families have been wiped out, warriors have been wiped out. Sub clans have been wiped out. The army has to be readied again. People have moved out of the Chittor area. That's a that's a nice fertile area. The hilly area that they are now in around Kumbhalgar, it's more difficult to farm. It's got the local bheels there. It's got some garasias there. You need to come to terms with them. So it's a time for uh, Pratap to rebuild, regroup, work out his policy. In 1572, Rana Pratap took over the reins of Mewar. By then, the forces of Mughal Emperor Akbar had control over large tracts of the kingdom, including Chittorgarh and Udaipur, the city built by Pratap's father, Uday Singh. And on the move, Rana Pratap used the Aravali Ranges and the region around Kumbalgarh to hold his own. Things came to a head in 1576 when the Mughal army marched towards this fort and met the Mewar forces under Rana Pratap somewhere here, in what is known as Haldi Ghati, thanks to the yellow sand likened to turmeric or Haldi here. While this battle ended with the Mewar army's defeat, Rana Pratap managed to escape to continue his charge against the Mughals. This has led to many interpretations around what really happened here in 1576. From the Mewar point of view, the ruler left the field and they cannot, they have still not come to terms with the fact that you do not have a battle in which the decision happens then and there. And with Haldi Ghati, the decision did not happen then and there. Uh, it is like a continuing war. So which of the facets of the battles do you say are the final ones? You know, it is Ek Ladai one of the many. The one which is more, uh, from the point of view of Mewar, more conclusive happens a few years later in Devir. But I won't jump to Devir. So Haldi Ghati was the might of uh, the Mughal army marching for what should have been a set-piece battle, a staged set-piece battle. What Pratap's side had prepared for was the guerrilla warfare which better suited that area. No one in their right minds would have thought of uh, Haldi Ghati, which at that point was literally a very narrow Ghati. It has been widened. 
road building. So when you go there now, you don't understand what it would have meant for the army to go one at a time and have their heads chopped off or not chopped off. And therefore, nobody knows exactly what the battlefield was. Was it Raktatalai, which was then before that Ratitalai? Was it the Badsha Bagh? Now, is Badsha Bagh called Badsha Bagh because the Badsha's army camp there? These are words we have. But what seems to have happened was the Mughal army is advancing. The Mewar army has been told by Maharana Pratap to go in for the scorched earth policy. So fill in all the wells, make sure that there is nothing, not even a twig that the, well, there would have been twigs, but you can't eat twigs. Nothing edible that the advancing army can have. Harass their supply lines. And perhaps Pratap was building up for confrontation at another point, not at this narrow ghati, which is yellow because the local stone uh, is crumbles to that color. And it seems that when it was only when he saw the cannons of the Mughal army being ferried across the local little river, that they decided that they needed to attack. So was it a case of a hurried battle on the part of the Mewar army? Nobody was ready at this point to have the war where they had it. Nobody was ready to leave the field. But again, Pratap is told by the immediate um, uh, uh, lieutenants around him, by the other Thakurs, that if you die or are taken captive here, Mewar has to rethink what it will do. If the commander of the Mughal army dies or is taken captive by us, nothing much will happen because Akbar is not on the battlefield. So he can afford to lose. He doesn't even have the uh, immediate uh, you know, mobile phone to be able to say, do this action or do not do this action. You do. So they persuade Pratap to leave the field and to take on this guerrilla warfare that he is already working towards and somebody else takes his place. So from that point of view, I think the Mewar army at that moment that decisive moment, if there is a decisive moment of Pratap leaving the field quietly, felt that they would keep fighting, that the battle would turn in somebody's favor, they hoped their favor, and uh, that would be the end of it. The Mughals were fighting, and then again there is this uh, urban legend that the Mughals talk about, uh, where they, one of them starts announcing loudly with a lot of drums, saying the Badshah is approaching. So that gives heart to the fighting Mughal troops, and uh, I don't know if it disheartened the uh, Mewar side, but it certainly egged on the attacking Mughal side, saying the emperor is coming, you have to show your valor, you will get rewarded. So I think for a long time, no one questioned or said who won Haldi Ghati. They knew that giving way on the field is one action that can be taken. Um, Pratap had to give way on that field. But as, as I've said in the book, quoting others, it's like a hollow victory. You do not have a captive Pratap. What you have is a lot of dead people or some live people who flee. What you also have is uh, Man Singh forbidding the Mughal army from pursuing. You know, it was getting to be nightfall. And he says, you will not pursue the Maharana running away or going away. Uh, leaving the field and for that now again Man Singh had a lot of detractors at the Mughal court they didn't like the fact that he had got his promotion they didn't like the fact that what the Mewar side uses as almost an insult for Man Singh the fact that he's related that Man Singh's aunt happens to be one of the wives of the emperor is also a negative for him because they keep saying you know you're only here because you're related to the ruler but the the Ruler is related to a lot of Rajputs by marriage. Um, Man Singh has to keep proving himself over and over and over again. And in this case, in this case, he's being told later on uh, that Akbar had had someone say to him, you know, this guy, he let Rana Pratap go away. It was because he's Rajput, he's still sympathetic. And so for a while, for almost a month and a half, uh, Asaf Khan, Asaf Khan and Man Singh are forbidden from coming into court. 
that lingering doubt perhaps stays because much much later the Rajputs are not the ones who lead the rest of the armies against Pratap after Haldighati. Whenever a chance comes, Pratap is faced by other generals. They could be of Afghan origin, they could be of Mughal origin, they could be of Turkish origin and they could have Rajputs as part of the army. But Man Singh is never given charge again, his father is never given charge again. Eventually they get posted off to the Punjab. So perhaps uh, at that point there was this common belief that over the in the pages of history has been gradually that voice has been subdued. But perhaps the voice at that point was loud enough saying the Rajputs are going to favor the Rajputs. They will keep allowing him to escape. They will never capture him. After the Battle of Haldighati in 1576, Maharana Pratap managed to keep a step ahead of the Mughals for the next 21 years. In 1582, he even attacked and occupied the Mughal post of the Ver. And over the years, he retrieved a lot of his territory in the south, even setting up Chawand as his new capital. By the 1580s, Akbar too had shifted his capital to Lahore, taking his eye off Mewar. In 1597, Rana Pratap died after the injury incurred during a hunt. His son Amar Singh continued the battle against the Mughals, but by the third generation, there was some thaw. In fact, the rebellious Prince Khurram, later Shah Jahan, was even given refuge in Udaipur as he took on his father. Turbans were exchanged between the grandsons. One thing is that the, the men uh, fighting these battles or taking decisions are pragmatic. They know that it's not just religion, it's not just you know, it, it cannot be simplified because their own relatives have often uh, taken up arms against them. So pragmatism is something that has to be practiced. And I said men a little while ago, the women also when they are giving their advice know that because they come from different clans. They know what has been going on in the plotting and planning of the, the uh, courts and the decisions being taken. So the message that they have their families understand and grow up with is there are no permanent enemies. The other part is that uh, no warrior is they grow up with the obligation of always giving refuge. Now Prince Khurram has already been negotiating on behalf of his father then Emperor Jahangir after or, uh, Akbar has died for Mewar to come to be part of the system which Mewar doesn't in quite the same way because even when they give way a little bit they have their terms and conditions uh, the, the ruler will never go to the court though the crown prince will so when Shah Jahan when Khurram needs refuge he gets the only reply that maybe even another enemy would have given in this case the other is not quite the enemy the other is someone who they have already met spoken to come to terms with and so they become brothers who exchange turbans and in Mewar they still have the turban of Khurram from those days and then when Khurram goes he get, gets the word that uh, Jahangir is dead and he goes to stake his claim on the Mughal throne and he is accompanied by the younger brother of uh, Karan Singh the then ruler of Mewar as a kind of ceremonial escort so no permanent enemies no permanent thing right my last question to you Reema uh, you've done so much of work on the history of Rajasthan and uh, with this book on Maharana Pratap in such detail as a historian what stands out for you in the saga between the legend and the history and the man and the times and also the fact as we've discussed of the uh, of the difficult uh, politics of that time. It was very complex. Uh, it's not easy to give it a black or white uh, kind of a, a shading, but it is a complex time. As a historian, what are your two, three takeaways from uh, Pratap and his life? Pratap, I think it is uh, one of the examples of how difficult choices being faced. How do you deal with them? Also, you know, they say, why did others yield in different places? 
that that uh, in others who yielded are they weaker are they also being shaped by the geography are you that much closer to the royal attackers do you have less options and therefore somebody else can have an option if you were anyone who wants to read about history i think if you kind of step back put yourself in their shoes and say what would you have done that is something that for me becomes a sobering thought what would pratap's solution have been if he was in some other more vulnerable area where he could not have gone into the hills he would perhaps still have died fighting and i had mentioned chandra singh of marwar and that is what happens to him in a way you know we've let another tragic figure and he is a more of a tragic figure because he confronts akbar he gives up his right to the throne his brothers become part of the mughal network and they get the title of the rulers chandrasen ends up being forced out of one place of refuge to another place that he's made his fort to another capital to eventually just dying almost a lonely death he's remembered now yes but what happens when you are actually dying in those last few moments you wonder perhaps that is something that uh becomes a sobering thought for anyone doing the history doing these things of what you take away but i think what for me was trying to go into the minds of these various people and the ending that i've put there of uh, a court poet a court poet who's now talked about and it might be a marwar perspective mewar perspective rajput perspective the story goes that when the news and it's in the book when the news of pratap's death was given to akbar at court now we don't know how akbar reacted whether i don't know what abul fazal has not put anything about it um what dursaara does is he's got this couplet in rajasthani in which he says that uh, pratap you have won the final victory you and this is a loose translation i'm not even looking at what i've put there so you who never came and bowed before the emperor who never stood before his window when he gave audience and you know did salam to him the word they used was mujra it doesn't mean the dance mujra you who wouldn't yield and now look everyone everyone turn look look at the emperor this news of your death has been brought to him his head is bowed look at the tears welling up in his eyes this is the emperor he is biting his tongue in among with his teeth obviously a way of mourning i it, it does not mean the same to us today now whether that was his reaction or not the legend the story is that dursa ara was rewarded now even if he was not the fact that this story is not suppressed that dursa ara is not told retract this whole couplet he is describing the enemy the death of an enemy he is describing it in the court of the man to whom from whom his money is coming he is describing this mughal emperor in a vulnerable phase an emperor crying an emperor speechless because his opponent and you see that is it again are there permanent solutions in history are there permanent enemies in history that thing of you know there but for the grace of god go i it could have happened to akbar akbar's half brother could have taken the capital he could have been the one running from place to place having to take hard decisions and so this is something perhaps that the armed forces of the police that people who have maybe even fought uh enemies as uh, refugees and have seen suffering will realize that revenge is not always the only solution and that valuing an opponent perhaps even akbar is thinking of what have i achieved at the end of all this how many people have i killed i don't know but i don't even know what the takeaways would be other than they also then become these strong figures who in moments of despair are upheld as 
a way of uh, being as you know you aspire to be someone like that so in the case of mewar when pratap's great grandson great great grandson is confronting aurangzeb raj singh maharana raj singh he brings he gives refuge he allows the statue which is now natwara of uh, shrinath ji to come into mewar at a time nobody else can give shelter and he is in a way being reckless enough like pratap had been saying come what may i have to live by the code that i have been told is the right code that then gets upheld over and over and over again uh, todd used this whole story to talk about the valor of uh, pratap uh, and and then the later uh, the indian national movement period the historians but then the storytellers take it up in different languages rajir kahini all of them take it up in different ways to talk about heroic figures men and women that you then think of as being the saviors of the land what the saviors themselves thought of in their dying moments thank you so much for joining us